Okay. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to record this session for a few folks who couldn't be here, so hopefully this all works out. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I've got a lot to get through. This is pretty dense, uh, so I'm going to have to hustle through some of it. Um, but if I start talking too fast, don't stop me because I might not make it in time. But I'm going to try to leave a couple minutes at the end to entertain some questions, okay? So the topic for today's Grand Rounds is omega-3 fatty acids. Now, why? Many of you know that uh, the study of nutrition and nutritional supplementation has been a passion of mine for some time. And, you know, I think nutrition is important, right, in the equation of health and wellness. So, you know, I was surprised to learn in medical school how little we do learn about the topic. You know, maybe two hours out of four years. And, you know, I think this really speaks to um, the model of uh, medicine in which we work. It's, you know, kind of in that it's a uh, system of uh, disease care rather than health care. You know, it seems like the more advanced we become in our technology, the more we are inventing these, these high-tech band-aids, you know, kind of addressing a lot of the symptoms and seldom the causes. So, you know, I think it's important to, to kind of look at this. And certainly, a lot of these issues are complex. You know, they're, the cause of disease is multifactorial. A lot of times requires an entire overhaul of lifestyle for patients, and that's not that's not a discussion for a 15 minute patient or 15 minute patient visit. So, we're going to look at omega-3 fatty acids today as a kind of subset of the dietary equation. So, what do we want to go through? What are omega-3 fatty acids? How do they work? Blah blah blah. But you know, my main objective for you guys is to give you something that you can take forward with you because you know I've given lectures and maybe I've attended a couple where I think, you know, that's a lot of cool information, but when I leave, do I really have anything that I can practically apply? So that's my goal, is to give you something that might be beneficial to yourself or to your patients or family and friends. So, you know you're in for a long one if I start with a slide like this, right? <laughs> you know, I, had, I wanted to draw this out because I think it's critical to build a foundation so that we can kind of build atop that. And so, what is an omega-3 fatty acid? We hear it all the time. And this is uh, a drawing of um, eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA, which is one of the chief omega-3 fatty acids that we're going to be talking about. And you can see it's a molecule with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And so what does omega-3 actually mean? Well, a lot of you have heard the terminology of the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Well, omega refers to the end of the molecule, which is the opposite of this goofy carboxyl group here. And so omega-3 means that it, this refers to the position of the first double bond, which is on the third carbon from the end. One, two, three. So if this were an omega-6 fatty acid, the first carbon would be on the sixth, uh, the first double bond would be on the sixth carbon, rather. So that just gives you a basic understanding of what the terminology means, omega-3. What does that mean? It refers to the structure. So some other terms that you'll hear associated with omega-3 fatty acids, polyunsaturated, that means there are multiple double bonds within the structure. So a saturated fatty acid, for example, will have no double bonds and it'll, all the bonds will be uh, filled up with hydrogen molecules. So this is polyunsaturated because it has multiple double bonds. And that sort of, if we look down here, I kind of drew how it, uh, these double bonds uh, cause the molecule to bend a little bit. So it takes on this different conformation compared to saturated fatty molecules and that sort of thing. So within the body, it, it sort of bends on itself and, and forms this figure. And this has some important um, implications that we'll get to later. But one of the other terms you always hear associated with these omega-3s is that they're essential. So we can't produce them, or at least the parent compounds. We'll kind of get to how you can make one from another, but we have to get them through our diet. You know? So it, it, they're, they're vitamins. You know, they're vital to our existence, and we have to consume them. So I kind of put some summary slides here since a couple of these slides get a little congested, but Omega-3s are named according to structure, they're polyunsaturated, have many double bonds which leads to bending, and they're essential. Okay, so this is kind of another schematic of a of fatty acid, and so what do our bodies actually do with these once, once we ingest them? Well, we form these phospholipids, so there's like this phosphate-based head, uh, and then there are these two fatty acid tails, and this is a phospholipid. So what we do is we stick these omega-3s on these phospholipids, and then these phospholipids get incorporated into cellular membranes. Okay, so they compose the cell membrane that encapsulates all of our tissue cells. And so we can kind of see that here. We have this phospholipid bilayer, if we remember back to high school chemistry class. So 
Again, omega-3 stored in phospholipid bilayer membranes. Now, these next slide get a little bit confusing, a little bit, con a little bit overwhelming, I should say, visually overwhelming. So I kind of circle some things to draw your attention, but we'll walk through it. So what we're talking about, again, is omega-3 fatty acids, and the main thing we're going to contrast that to is omega-6 fatty acids. You, mi you might hear about those, but one of the underlying principles to this talk is that omega-3 fatty acids beget anti-inflammatory molecules, hormone-like molecules that have anti-inflammatory effects, whereas omega-6 fatty acids, one of the chief uh, fatty acids being arachidonic acid, uh, produces pro-inflammatory molecules. Okay, so if we kind of look at this, if you can imagine these guys, the AA, arachidonic acid, and the EPA, um, the omega-3 fatty acid, in that membrane that we talked about, phospholipase A2 is what cleaves them from the membrane and releases them, allows for us to make active uh, products out of those. And just kind of note here, this is our target for corticosteroids, prednisone. So if we inhibit this, we're going to inhibit the conversion of arachidonic acid to all these pro-inflammatory molecules. And then once phospholipase A2 cleaves these, either the omega-6 or the omega-3, from the membrane, then they're acted upon by these other enzymes, cyclooxygenase, lipoxygenase, and of course we're familiar with this, right? Cyclooxygenase, the COX enzyme, so a target for you know, anti-inflammatory NSAIDs. Um, and so that's the mechanism of action there. And so once these things are acted upon by the different enzymes, they're converted into thromboxanes, prostaglandins, leukotrienes. So we're kind of familiar with these from medicine. But a lot of times people associate them just with an, in, an inflammatory process. But they're anti-inflammatory uh, molecules. Um, but it kind of depends on what series you're talking about. So omega-6 is formed 2 and 4s and 3 and 5s over here. So they're just different. We've got pro and anti-inflammatory um, eicosanides is what they're called. So another big overwhelming slide, but what I want to focus in on here is that that last slide was one of the first mechanisms, or rather one of the second mechanisms. Uh, the first being uh, something we'll refer to a little bit later, but um, the anti-inflammatory capacity by way of uh, forming these eicosanides was, uh, is one of the chief things we're going to address, but this is kind of a, a, uh, another issue that's equally as important, is that these fatty acids, we see here again the EPA and DHA, these omega-3 fatty acids, are when they're acted upon by these immune cells, neutrophils and that sort of thing, they form resolvins. It's kind of cut off here a little bit, but marisins or marisins, potato, potato. And these things are so named because, for example, resolvins, they're called resolution phase interaction products. They help to clean up inflammation. In the resolution phase of inflammation, it helps to, to uh, resolve that, that acute reaction, or maybe chronic in some circumstances. Marezin's more of the same. It's even a later molecule that's formed, and it, for example, it kind of tells some of the neutrophils to go away, brings in some of the macrophages, which sweep up some of the debris and that sort of thing. And then something else that's formed are these protectins, um, and those are so named because they have the ability to protect cells, like there's neuroprotectin, which is very important for our central nervous system. And they mainly protect them from um, oxidation from reactive oxygen species and that sort of thing. So we, we're kind of getting a sense here. There, there's this anti-inflammatory component. There's this protective mechanism about these omega-3 fatty acids. So this is the most overwhelming slide of all, but this really ties in a lot of the, um, a lot of the mechanisms for us, okay? And we're going to kind of discuss a couple of them here. So we see yet again the phospholipid bilayer. We've got DHA, um, arachidonic acid, the omega-6 and omega-3 in the bilayer. They're cleaved here by the phospholipase A2. What I should actually say before that is just being a part of the, the um, bilayer, we talked about how the omega-3 and specifically that DHA, how it had all of the um, double bonds. Well, that causes it to be, because it is so kinky, I guess I should use a, maybe, maybe the term bendy, how about that? Because it's so bendy, that, you know, that has important implications in the membrane fluidity. Okay, so if we remember back to, again, maybe a uh, high school chemistry class, they talked about the phospholipid bilayer being this, this fluid mosaic. Because if we were to look at this thing, it's all these things that make up the membrane are kind of moving around, and they're in here, there are these ion channels, and there are protein transducers, and all this sort of thing. And you can imagine a saturated fatty acid that is more straight in nature. It's kind of like being in a tight room, like a convention center or something. You've got people shoulder to shoulder. Can't move anywhere. That's kind of what happens in the lipid bilayer. It's, it's much more of a static uh, um, membrane when you've got more of these saturated fatty molecules. 
Whereas when you have the omega-3 uh, uh, fatty molecules with all these bends in it, you know, if I were to stand like this in a, con a busy convention hall, it frees up some space, right? So we have more room to, room to move, our neighbors can't get as close, that sort of thing. So that has important implications and we're just starting to understand some of this in the science, but that changes the ion uh, transport across the cellular membranes. It changes some of the signaling properties. So that's one mechanism right there. And this other one is what we talked about. These are freed from the membrane. They form these anti or pro-inflammatory eicosanoids right here. A third mechanism that we talked about up here, we can see the resolvents and protectins being formed uh, out in the periphery of this picture. And here, we didn't mention this yet, but this is another uh, big mechanism, is that these fatty acids can bind what are a lot of uh, floating uh, fatty acid receptors within the cell. And so some of these, PPAR, some, some of these are, are hot areas of research right now. So they'll bind these, and these actually have the ability to go in the nucleus and act as transcription factors. So they transcribe genes, they change the expression of our genes. So this is the concept of epigenetics, or more specifically, with omega-3 is nutrigenomics. So, you know, what we eat, you know, we are what we eat, the old saying. And, you know, to me, that's kind of empowering. I think it's important if we kind of convey that to our patients and, and explain to them that, hey, what you eat truly does change the, the, the type of disease uh, or the state of health you might have. So, to kind of sum that up, omega-3s, they increase membrane fluidity, the release from the cell membranes, they form all these things, prostaglandins, thromboxanes, resolvents, protectins, many molecular targets, they bind all these things in the cells, can alter gene transcription. So what's the difference between EPA and DHA? Well, there are a couple, and one that you'll uh, hear in the literature is that DHA tends to be the one associated with brain and neural tissue, okay? So just, just remember that. And the reason for that is because of some of its uh, properties as it passes the blood-brain barrier, and also the fact that, as this uh, review paper mentions, it has an ability to change its torsional state and to kind of change its configuration uh, quite rapidly. So this, again, contributes to a lot of that fluidity that we were talking about, and it's particularly important for areas of the, of the uh, body that require this, uh, this uh, quick changing of these membranes. Like, for example, in the back of the retina, or in the retina, in the rods uh, of the retina, as well as some of the, the vesicles at the uh, neuromuscular junction. Uh, so that, that's pretty cool. So associate DHA, with brain, and then EPA um, is, I kind of think of as being a little bit more of a peripheral acting uh, a molecule. It uh, functions on uh, some of the enzymes like we'll probably see in the next slide. So there is a little bit of a difference here, but they act together, okay? And one is actually formed from the other, but we'll, we'll look at that too. And something else I want to mention is that, you know, I told you to associate DHA with the brain. And it's kind of interesting because, first of all, the brain weight by dry, dry weight is 30% DHA. So, I mean, that is uh, pretty, pretty astounding when you think about it. And it's really pretty interesting because historically there have been a lot of theories you guys may be familiar with, with humans having grown on the plains of Africa and that sort of thing. And that's where we really uh, gained a lot of our intelligence and our brain development. Well, some people recently challenged that. There's a guy, uh, Michael Crawford, Dr. Michael Crawford in London, who said, that can't be right. He said it had to be somewhere where we had access to DHA and these omega-3 fatty acids, because as we'll find, uh, they mainly come from seafood, sea sources. So he said, that can't be right. And so he kind of really researched this, spent a lot of time, and they, he proposed that, you no, know, it was actually on the east coast of Africa where we had access to fish that our brain development took off. And other people looked at this and said, you know what, we think you're right. So it's, it's kind of cool when you think about this historically, and it really implies some of the importance of the DHA. So again, this is comparing omega-6 to omega-3. Um, I had mentioned that EPA acts on some enzymes um, peripherally, and if we look, there's an, this enzyme delta 5 desaturase, EPA inhibits this, which will inhibit the omega-6 conversion into inflammatory uh, molecules. So in other words, there's this balance. And what we want to do is we want to increase our omega-3s such that we can kind of inhibit some of this in, in inflammatory cascade that, that occurs, okay? So it's, again, it's this balance. We're going to look at that more uh, a little bit in depth. So this, is, this could be like the, the summation of my entire presentation. You guys probably would have, some of you might have uh, preferred if I just put this up and then left the room. But, you know, it, if we, I think in modern medicine, we've become especially good at 
labeling pa people with a, a codifiable diagnosis and then kind of shipping them <coughs> off to the appropriate specialist, right? And, you know, so everybody, the consequence is everybody has ownership of a particular portion of the, a particular system of the patient. So, I don't know, what do we own? Maybe everything except for some stuff in this general region. But, you know, it's silly, right? Because we know that the body is one, one unit. So, we're, you know, in light of those remarks, it, we're starting to really pay a lot more attention to common denominators between disease. So, when we look at diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, pulmonary, all these things, what we now know from the literature is that they share a, com now, of course, they're multifactorial, but they share one common underpinning common denominator, which is inflammation, and we're starting to catch on to that. You know, I don't know if we're doing a whole lot about it, but we're certainly starting to recognize it more. So because of this, um, and the important implications of omega-3s, there, there are piles of literature that can fill this whole room, and, you know, which is pretty unusual for dietary supplementation and kind of uh, nu nutrition uh, literature, but on all sorts of topics. So we're just going to be able to brush this, just going to uh, throw up some, some of my favorite studies. But unfortunately, we won't be able to go into too much depth, but there's a lot out there. So let's look at some of these. So omega-3 fatty acids effect on stress. They found um, some cortisol-lowering effects of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. In this particular study, this was a group that did a couple of studies, um, and they wanted to see the effect of high-dose omega-3 fatty acid supplementation for two months on young individuals. Uh, and what, what they did was measure their epinephrine.